Okay, okay. We have got all our bits and pieces ready to go here. So it is an absolute honor and privilege for me to introduce you guys today, whether you're watching live, whether you're watching a recording, whether you're here with us live. I'm truly, it's, it's just such, I, I get the giggles every time of just how, how beautiful it is to share this experience. So I want to welcome to our evolutionary guest speaker event, Christina Matheson-Segura, who is to me, such a beautiful example and powerhouse. I mean, when she was diagnosed with cancer, she chose to own her power more so than the illness and see what she could create from it. And not just for herself, but for others. And she's going to share the journey, but who documented it, the whole process so that she could share and be a light for others who were going to forge along this path after the fact. We talk about evolutionary. I, I think it's so amazing. And above also did a non-for-profit called You'll Be Okay Too, so that the people had resources to go to and connect. But as I say, every time we're here, nobody wants to hear from me about her story. They want to hear directly from her. So Christina, first, thank you so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to learning and sharing with you during this time together. Thank you so much for the invitation. You know, I'm so excited to always meet really forward thinking people and meet people that want to learn from each other. So we are a community and it's so important that we share, you know, the, the majority of our stories because there's always something that connects us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to go through this and just kind of ask you some questions. A lot of it, I am going to kind of lean on you because it's such a beautiful and intricate and it's not just the kind of journey where it's a question, answer, question, answer. Some of the questions may kind of flow it. But one of the ones I love to always start with is who are you at your soul level? At my soul level, I am somebody that uh, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a mentor at my soul level. Like I feel like I've, I've come this far, my soul has come this far to help. I feel like my soul has had unfinished business. Mm. Um, and I, I just want to leave this place a better place than I found it. So I almost feel like I'm doing some unfinished business. Oh, my God. I love that. One of the best answers. <laughs> That's so beautiful. I love that. So what would you say at this stage with that mentality and that heart and that desire to be, and I say it all the time, be the change we want to see in the world, right? I, like, what, what is your life's message? what you offer, what you bring to life, what you live through? My life's message, um, I, I've i been, you know, trying to figure out what makes people successful. And that's the definition of success is different from everyone, right? Everyone wants to do something different. Money does not equate to success, right? We, we want to have the time and the freedom to do the things that make us happy. And part of my evolution as a woman and as a human being has been really to, you know, you say own your power. I feel that for the majority of my adult life, I was smarter than the average bear. I was more emotionally intelligent and I, I held it down because I didn't want to be in the spotlight and I didn't want to overshadow anybody around me. So I just tried to be, you know, average. And I'm not average. I'm just not. And I don't believe that any of us are. I believe that all of us are, are brought to this earth with certain gifts and talents. And we're supposed to share them. We're supposed to, you know, we're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to talk to each other. And in this day and age of the internet, not wanting to share your story, if it's going to bring some kind of positivity or power to somebody else. I don't think that that's a cool thing. I think that it's our obligation um, to share as much as we can. Now, I would never share anything about my children or my this or my that. That's not, you don't need to know my whole life. You just need to know the stories that I know I've gone through that will help you. Almost to compress time. So you don't have to live through it to learn the lessons if you take the lessons of someone else. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. How do you get from point A to point B or across right. that bridge with a little bit more ease and grace? Mm -hmm. And I love what you said there because you touched on something that's really, really um, close to my heart right now. 
is, you know, in, and I, I, again, I, I'm on this thing about with women, even the Evolution Academy, most everyone right. knows it's kind of transitioning to be for women to stand together because mm-hmm. we are very unique in our own powers and abilities. And we're also Absolutely. unique in in the journey where a lot of women like you were afraid to show it. Like, it's like, oh my God, you've done, and it's not even like, it's about this fear of shining. Yes. And you know, how do we We bring women in? We fear that. Like what's going to happen? I don't know. Maybe I'll just be happy. Yeah. But there's like, people are afraid they're going to lose people. They're going to like, we're so comfortable with commiserating in the negative. How do we all come together and celebrate each other's wins? Right. You know? You know, I love one that. of the I love funny that. thing that. is, one of the funny things is that for many years I've been very focused on positive energy. And of course, you know, you're not going to be happy, jolly every minute of the day, although I really do believe that I'm the happiest person that I know. I choose that, right? I choose to look for that positivity in everything. I am the queen of the the silver lining in every cloud. That's just how I choose to live my life. So much so that when I'm around someone that is just living in that misery or that negative space, I can feel it. And I have to be like, Mm -hmm. oh, look at the time. I have to go. I just, I like, I physically can't do it. So I call them energy vampires. I think it's like a term they have. And it's true because. And it's real. we, We, it is real because, you know, that's what they were talking about. Even in communication, when we're speaking, we can have words. And if our body, our energetics aren't matching, yeah. Like the other person can feel it. Right. Yeah. So you can have someone who's, oh, isn't that great? And their body, you can see is all tense up. Like you're going to feed and read that. Yeah. So yeah. super, super aligned with that. You know what else too? I think that when we finally get brave enough to step out and, and, and do things and make change, there will be people around us that we thought were our people, our friends, our family, and they're not going to clap for us. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter because we're going to clap for us. So you you can't look for that validation from everybody around you. Everyone is not going to rise up like you are. Everyone is not going to choose to be positive and happy and give back and be a community. It, and it's okay. That doesn't have to be their life. It's it's the life you choose, not them. I love that. And, and, and a lot of that too. And, and, and it's so interesting. We were talking a little bit before we went live is this idea because there are people, it's their reason, right? Like they're afraid to try. They're afraid it's not going to work out. And so when they see you doing it, they're going to actually try and hold you back because then it rips away their reason for it. And so it's so powerful. And I love what you're saying because, and I think this is the key. And then we, we talk about like more of your story, but it's like, how do you, give yourself that permission. I I compare it to like a drug fix. Like there are people out there when it's external, when you need someone else to make you feel, then the minute they stop, it's it's like a drug fix. You're like, oh, I got to go find more of it. And so you're modifying and morphing who you are to get this fill up. Whereas when like you own it and love it, and maybe not everyone's going to go for it, but you will. You know what I found? I found that, you know, up until I turned 50, most of my friends were men. And the reason was a lot of women just, they were just, they weren't my type. They weren't, I I don't have the words to explain it. They were just not my tribe. And once I turned 50, it's, it's almost like I recognized or I could feel who those other women were in my tribe. And you almost become a magnet to them when, when you, you know, and maybe because when I, when I was about at the cusp of 50, that's when I really started to look into, you know, the, 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 the law of attraction and the universe and how energy works. And I used to think it was really woo woo, you know, and uh, I realized that it's real and it's, it's the way that I choose to live my life. I love it. I love it. So share with us a little bit about your journey. As I said, a lot of my questions are more like when people have a process, but I would love to kind of dig in and really just hear your heart and, and, and your story. Sure. And Sure. I'm happy to share it. So in September of 2020, after a long time of being single, I met this wonderful man and we got engaged. 
And I was so happy and, you know, had all of these great things ahead of me. And it was also part of my transition into this positive human being that I, I didn't need him. You know, I didn't need him to be whole. And I, I found him, I think, because of that. So we were very, very happy. We, we got locked in during COVID together. We got engaged. So that was in September. And on November 9th, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So like two months down the road. And at first I was like, cause you know, in business, I'm a problem solver. So at first I was like, okay, wait a minute. I, I got to get out of this. Like somehow I'm going to solve this problem. Like I'm going to get out of it. And this is not going to be so the backstory. Of course I couldn't do that. The backstory is that 40 years before my mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer. So I was only maybe 17 when she had her first surgery and I'm an only child. And the, the medical community and the treatment for breast cancer and chemotherapy specifically was very, very different then. And the way that I refer to it is I almost felt that my mom, when she had chemo, was brought as close to death as they could possibly bring you at that point in the hope that they'd kill the cancer, but they wouldn't kill the patient. So is it the very beginning of, of this era of, of treating cancer successfully? So some people lived and some people didn't. Unfortunately, my mom was not one of those people that lived. So she you know, had a, a very radical mastectomy. She went, there was no reconstruction then. So she went on with like one breast and a scar. And that's very hard mentally. I can tell you just from you know my experience that that's a, a, just a very hard thing to deal with. We all think that we're a lot tougher than we are. And we also think that we're a lot softer than we are. So it goes both ways, right? Whatever the whatever it is that you need, wherever you need your power to be, you're going to find it, right? You just got to pull it out of you. So in the very beginning, when I was first diagnosed, I was riddled with anxiety. I couldn't sleep or I would go to sleep and I would wake up at two or three in the morning gasping for air and a full-blown panic attack thinking I'm going to die. I'm going to, because I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I was thinking that I was just reliving my mom's history. And it took a lot for me to just be like, okay, I'm going to do this. And I started going through the process, but I realized that there was not really any information on how do you do this? Is there a checklist? Like what's going to happen to me? Can you give me a timeline? Can you give me, I don't know, maybe I'm just too much of a business person, or maybe I think of it differently than other people do. But I was relatively, I'm a pretty resourceful woman. Um, I have some, some great friends and family. I'm truly blessed. And I didn't, I didn't know what's like, okay, so how do you do this? I was looking for, there's no manual. So I reached out to a few close friends. They connected me with women that they had known that had gone through this and that they were fine. I was looking for hope. I was looking for people to tell me I did it. I lived it and you'll be fine. I did it. I had chemo. I had radiation. I had the surgery. I had this. I, I want you to tell me it happened to you 10 years ago or 20 years ago and that you're fine and you're living a perfectly normal life. I realized that that was such a deep need of mine that one day I just said, okay, well, there's going to be other women that this happens to. So where I live on Long Island in New York, one in eight women get breast cancer. Hey, one in eight women get breast cancer. That's a horrible number. 13% of women get breast cancer in their lifetime. And if I couldn't do anything for my mom, maybe I could do this for somebody else's mom. So I started to document my entire journey. And I expected it to be, you know, like I thought it was a little bit crazy, but I thought it needed to be done. So like I said, I'm a problem solver. It ended up being so great for me because it was almost like having my own therapist. I would take my phone. And I would sit at six o'clock in the morning or five in the morning with my most intimate thoughts and I would record them and I wouldn't watch them back. I just record them for later. And I knew that 
I wanted to share my story when it was over, when I was all better, when I could say, you know, I'm okay and you'll be okay too. So throughout the course of time, um, I share, you know, how I'm going to pick a doctor, how, wh what is it is that I'm feeling, what's going on with me at the time. Am I, so I had chemotherapy first, which I had a real problem with based on what I held inside me in my head from seeing my mom go through it. And a lot of it I had repressed. So it all came rushing back at one time, which I think was one of the reasons that I had so much anxiety. And I just shared it and I just talked about it. And I had so much video, in fact, that when I when it was over and I was better and I found a producer, there was like 150 hours of video. You can't make a 150 hour documentary. So these poor people had to sit through hours and hours and hours of footage. Um, and I gave them guidance of, you know, wh what I envisioned. I envisioned it to be a story of hope, not gloom and doom. There's one spot in the documentary where I'm just, you know, in the middle of it and it's just getting old for me. I think it's really the only depressing time, uh, but it's very short. And then the next day I come, you know, later in that day, I come back with some positivity. I go through, um, you know, the story of my fiance. I ended up obviously marrying him. and. The first time that I saw the documentary all put together, I realized that it was a love story. And that's something that I didn't expect to happen because he was with me the whole way. And every time I did a video, I'd say, well, my Jose, my husband's name is Jose. My Jose did this for me. My Jose took care of me. My Jose this. And so we premiered the documentary this past June in uh, a local theater. And since then, everybody says, how's my Jose or how's your Jose? Because he really is almost the, like the, the main character. I'm narrating all of this, but there's Jose. There's Jose saving the day. And in, in days like this where I don't even know if you'd call it chivalry, just like a, a really good human being and a wonderful man who loves his wife, um, it ends up being the love story. So we've had, you know, just about 800 views. I put it up on YouTube for anybody that wants it. And I think the message that I really wanted to share was that a lot of people said to me, oh, you're so brave. Number one, I didn't volunteer for this. So the only choice I had was, was I going to do whatever my medical team said to do to stay alive and live a long life? Because my children, although they're in their 30s, are not cooked. My grandchildren need me. You know, I have all of these people around me that I, I realized through this process, it was not just me loving them, but they have, they love me. And I saw it in so many ways that maybe I didn't take the time to see before. I never really had the time to slow down. I never really had the time to overthink. Um, and it was such a gift. I learned how to rest for the first time in my life which I had never done. So I was a single mom with four kids. Um, but ultimately what I learned is that while I didn't check the box and say, well, give me this, you know, this horrific problem and let me go through a year's worth of this and that. Not only was I powerful, but we're all powerful. We all have that. And I'm left with the question that I had before I was diagnosed with cancer. And that is, why is it that we as women have to have our back against the wall to make it be okay that we're strong? Why do we have to sit back? Why are we, why is it that I had to be a single mother, you know, post divorce, no child support, four kids, that I could have the balls to do what had to be done? And nobody would give me a hard time. It was because I didn't care. My children were more important. So, you know, I, I think that that whole not caring what other people think is, is not a bad thing. It's not like we don't care about them, but we choose our own path. Um, and if you choose that path of power, own it. So that's what I did. Documentary is doing well. Women are reaching out saying thank you or 
my sister was just diagnosed, my niece was just diagnosed, what would you do, what would you this? Um, so it's really just an amazing time. I watched, I watched as I stood on the stage at the theater, we maybe had, I don't know, 100 people, the, the near and dear ones. When I sat in the chair, you know, hooked up to the, the chemo drip, so I had a port attached to my chest and and the whole time I just kept visualizing, like I'm making a documentary and I'm gonna stand on the stage and I'm gonna help people and this is all gonna be worth something. And it's 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 important. I, I never thought of me as being sick. I thought of it as a project that I was doing and that really helped me and it's now helping other people. So it makes me very happy. Thank you. That is so amazing and beautiful on so many levels and and you know i love what you said too when you said when we when we say we don't care what you think it's not that we don't care about you right it's just that we're prioritizing to say i can still love you but choose to to trust myself to listen to right. myself right and and like you said and, and it's interesting because when you say like to have the back up against the wall and it was like, yeah, I love that. My children aren't cooked. <laughs> they're, <laughs> not, awesome. they're not done. They need me. <laughs> the kids need to be cooked and the kids are, you know, the grandkids are just simmering still. But it's it's something so powerful when you talk about it, like, because even that, like at that moment when we can turn it outwards, right? And say, oh, this is the reason. And that's connecting to that why and having, I would love to see, especially as women, we're, we bring that home to ourselves too, right? Like to say, how do I do this? And we talked about it before we started. It's like, why do we have to wait until it's at a moment where it's a desperation that doesn't have we to find be a our crisis. voice? Right. It's okay. How do we step in? Yeah. It's okay. And and for women that have a crisis, whether it's a you know a, a marital crisis or a health crisis, or we all have stuff going on in our families, Absolutely. whatever it is. The secret to it is, you know, Jack Canfield talks about E plus R equal O. So Jack Canfield wrote um, Chicken Soup for the Soul many years ago, and he's just a great speaker and an author and a teacher. And, and so E is the event. So we cannot control the events that happen around us. R is your reaction. We can control our reaction to them. And our reaction to these things that happen in our lives creates the outcome. So to just freak out and lose it, you, you're giving up your control of that situation. You're giving up your ability to think. And, you know, from going through chemo for me, it, it made me foggy. It, it, and I just, I would sit in that chair and be like, you know, when I'm done with this, I'm going to be able to think just like my regular self thinks. Like I just wanted my ability to think back. And people say to me when I go to places, oh, do you want to drink? I'm never putting anything in my body ever again that's going to make me foggy, period. I don't care. I'm not doing it because I valued my ability to think and my ability to ration and my power. My power was here and it was here. So that's what amazing. I chose. That's amazing. And, and I think there's something interesting too so like when you say that right like so many of us it's like have you ever looked at a picture of you when you were younger and when you used to think you were horrible and ugly and fat yes, and then you get yes. to and you look back and you go oh my god i was so beautiful how did i yeah. not what's wrong with so there me must, yeah so is is part of that too because to go through that and be like oh my god i'm so desperate to get who i was at that state not who i was because yeah. we always are changing but makes you appreciate what you who you were at that moment right in such a different way you know what else too along those lines i think that for some reason and maybe it has to do with you know how we hold ourselves back right so we know we can do certain things but we want to stay in the shadows we don't want to be in the forefront i just think that admitting i don't know if it's part of my journey i don't know if it's because i'm getting older i'm 59 i don't know if i'm getting this great wisdom at my age but what i do know is i can tell you what my gifts are what my traits are what are my great qualities and i am not ashamed to say that anymore it used to be 
I remember when I was younger to be like, oh, she's so conceited. She's this, the other women would drag us so far down and it starts from teenage years or even younger. And I have no qualms now about telling you how great I am at certain things and also telling you, for example, I have zero sense of direction. And I'm fine with that because I have a phone and the lady tells me where to go. And I don't need to use my brain power for that. I can admit that there's certain things that I don't know how to do. And I'm fine with that. I, I think that we just get comfortable in our own skin as long as we realize where that power is and do what we want with it. And and I love what you're saying. And that's and that's part of like what we're what we're trying to create here and, and with people like you because it is so difficult when you see a woman trying to spread her wings and other women are knocking her down. It's like, no, and because it's not us, it's not what we want to do. We're, we're assigning ourselves to the status quo, the conditioning, the good girl rules that have told us we're not supposed to shine in our ultimate feminine power and divine power. And so how do we start to take those chances? Because you know, there's so many people waiting on the sideline looking for someone to give them the white flag to say, go be spectacular. So, you know, one of the funny things that I try to do every year, I'm, I'm not really a rebellious person. I'm just not. You know, I went to Catholic school for many years and that beats the rebel right out of you. But I always wear white the day after Labor Day just to make a point. You have a, that's a stupid rule. And I put it on social media like, here I am. I'm wearing white. It's September 15th, but I don't care. <laughs> who made this rule? Who says you can't exactly. do that? I don't have that. I don't care. Like, that's dumb. Am I hurting anybody by putting my white pants on, you know, the day after Labor Day? No. You I love that. I like, love you that. Know, wear your white pants. I don't care. <laughs> wear black nail polish. Does that mean you're a witch? No. <laughs> Whatever you want. I love that. It's one of my favorite things is when they say, well, you can't do that. I'm always like, that's who? Like, who makes these rules out? Yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that. So, Christina, what, what advice would you give people at this stage if they're moving through? It? And again, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be cancer, because I think your power and your perspective mm-hmm. can also give any, whether, whether they're an abusive relationship, whether they're you know, just their own beating themselves up or if there any kind of illness, anxiety, uh, multiple disorder, whatever it might be. Right. I think your your take on it is truly something that crosses multiple, multiple layers and boundaries of, of what women go through or people in general, but women too. What would be some of the key takeaways, do you think? Um, the key takeaways for for me when I look back on my journey through this is that if we realize that most situations are only temporary. So if it's whatever it is, and it's not some horrific health thing, right? Most most of the stuff that we deal with is temporary. And if we lose um, our emotional cool about anything, we're not gonna be able to think our way out of it. I think that many times in my life, it's not that my power was taken away. I gave it away because I was trying to smooth things over. I was trying to make my life easy. I was in a, you know, an abusive marriage, hence the the divorce and being a single mom. And my life and my livelihood depended on this man who was just, we won't get into it, but we all know stories. And I just thought, you know what? We're not going to die. I'm going to make sure that, that my kids have, learn the right way how life is supposed to be so we have to just think as best as we can in times that are tough and I'll tell you the tough times are what has taught me always bringing myself back to the center saying okay I didn't make this happen um people can say what they want whether it's my you know whoever you're arguing with or whatever their opinion does not define me I define me and you make a path and one step at a time, nobody's going to get out of a crisis in one fail swoop. And also whenever there's a crisis, it doesn't come one step at a time. It comes, mm-hmm. it comes in like a bang. So you can get into it fast, but you can't get out of it fast. So one piece at a time, 
day at a time, progress, and and find that place. Like when you look, we so many of us that are looking forward, never take a minute to look back, but only to see how far we've come. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something really important to give ourselves a little pat on the back and say, you know what, you're doing it. You're doing good. One little step at a time. Absolutely. Self-celebration. And like you said, there's so many people that think it's being egotistical or whatever, but there's so much power to take that moment and look because you forget, right? Especially women, we tend to, we could do 97% fantastic. And we're going to berate ourselves for the three. I mean, even look at, look at how we are typically, right? If I give you a compliment, most, well, not you probably going to say, yeah, baby. but a lot of women <laughs> no. start to, but a lot of women we've been trained to be like, Oh no, this thing. Oh, it's an old piece. Oh yeah. no, no. Oh, yeah, you, know, you must need your glasses. Exactly. Like we deflect all this yeah. thing. Whereas when you can actually look at it and, and welcome it. And you know, you say something really powerful too, though, because where I see a lot of people get stuck is this fear. Cause you're right. When a trauma happens, it usually happens pretty fast. Yep. But what I love about your, your journey and your message and your voice is knowing that you're going to be okay. You will be okay because some people will freeze with the fear of what could happen and yeah. then they don't live anything. Right. Like you're afraid and they don't move so because like, well, what is worry? We live in, we're worried about things that are never going to happen. Exactly. We steal what even the opportunity. I what know. Just live it. I know. You know, I, I've learned that um, even if I don't know how to do something at this point, I say yes. And I figure it out later because I don't want to waste any time. I'm squeezing every drop of juice out of that orange. I love that. And we're, so if you look at who you were before mm -hmm. versus who you are now, do you find that a lot of like, I'm, I'm squeezing every inch out. Was that kind of your same mentality prior and that helped you carry it? Or do you think yeah. you, you were able to appreciate that even more because you had that, that brisk kind of in between lines. Well, I, to look I, at? I had evolved personally. I did a lot of self-reflection because I, I, all of the things where we can just easily say, well, I was the victim. Someone did this to me. Someone did that to me. I wanted to take my power back. And I did that, you know, a decade before I got diagnosed. So I was, I was as well prepared mentally and my mindset as anybody could be to have something like this. But it's the little things that bring me, I, I'm so proud of. And it never fails. So I had a double mastectomy reconstruction where they cut you from hip to hip and you they take that belly fat and they make new boobs for you so it's really kind of great when you're old and you get new boobs and they're up here right so but that was a really big surgery and <laughs> I had a hysterectomy at the same time so it was a 12-hour operation the wow. reason that I'm sharing this is that I was a mess when I came home right I was stitched I was I couldn't I had to have the recliner like I was you know 85 years old and and you take up a, a, like a power chick like me and you, you give me a few hundred stitches. And I was just so frustrated. I couldn't take a shower by myself. I couldn't bathe by myself. I couldn't do a lot of things. And every day when I get in the shower, I'm like, damn girl, look at you go. You're taking a shower by yourself. Like it was the world's biggest accomplishment because I will never forget what that mm. felt like you know, to have to have help with something so personal. Um, but again, my Jose, it's really a beautiful thing. So to briefly answer your question after a very long answer, I was, I was kind of, um, I was kind of cool with things before I was kind of empowered, but now after living that, I realize how powerful I am. And I realize that we all have it in us. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to empower the rest of us to find your power with that. You don't, you don't need a crisis. It's in there. Just dig, just dig a little bit. Absolutely. I love that. And, and even that, if you, rather than wait for a real crisis, pick one. This is like, oh my God, you know, my, my oh shoes my are going to fall apart. Died. I'm going to have to revisit my whole life now. Yes. Exactly. Create your own fun. <laughs> 
script of it so that you don't have to wait because that is unfortunately so many people wait until it's no longer a choice, right? It's like, because yeah. we, we live in this kind of like, Ah, it's not going. And, and it, it, for myself too, my thing always back in the day was I have time. I have, to, and I still think I have lots of time. But it's like, well, why not start it? You know, at at certain point, you have to be okay. I do have time. I have lots of years ahead of me. But like you said, I want to squeeze the living juice out of my right. You no, know? you know, one of the things that I've been doing for years, um, because I just wasn't having it, is. Let's talk about, so you're in Canada. I don't know where the rest of you are, but we have Thanksgiving. You all know. And Thanksgiving is this big holiday and everybody with a big family fights on, well, I'll come for breakfast. I'll come for lunch. I'll come for dessert. I'll come for dinner, but we have to go here and we have to go there. I changed Thanksgiving about 15 years ago and I made Thanksgiving on the Sunday and we call it Thanksgiving Sunday. And all of my children could go wherever they want. My boys can go to their mother-in-law's. My girls can go to their mother. Go. I do the same thing with Mother's Day. Go. I'm going to make my own holiday. So I will sit and, you know, watch the Thanksgiving Day parade, not cooking a turkey with my feet up and my fuzzy slippers. I don't care. It doesn't bother me that it's Thanksgiving because in one way I'm creating my own holiday because nobody, I don't have to go by that rule because the calendar says the third Thursday or whatever it is. I don't play that game. And in another way, and I'm really almost manipulating my entire family and friends into making my own holiday, and they all come. So you think I you love can it. do that with anything? It's okay. yes. It's okay. I call it make your own rule. Draw your hair purple. Do whatever you want. Yes, that's what I was actually just been talking about because I have a workbook and it's called Life Scripts. I'm like, you actually get to write the rules. You don't have to subscribe or succumb to what is common, what is status quo, what you've been told, especially again, as women in, and I'm not just talking about holidays, I'm talking about in everything. Anything. Anything. Anything, I love that. Wear white pants after Labor Day. Wear them Christmas morning. I don't care, nobody cares. You don't have to wear the ugly sweater. It's ugly, you don't, you throw it out. You don't need it. <laughs> but even if you love it, then again, you're doing it to fill yourself up, right? Not to please. And I think that's Christmas the thing. Sweater, wear, wear it on Halloween. Wear it in November. Wear it in January. Wear it whenever you want. You don't only exactly. have to wear it at Christmas time. Like, I know. I will... and, and there's something so beautiful too, because part of that, other than just saying I'm a rebel and making rules, it's truly like, it's like you said, it's a love story, but of self also. Right? It's yeah. like, I love myself to to care about what I think about me, to, yeah. to feel good about myself and not sacrifice who and what I am for an image other people. Right. But most of the time we don't even know or we may not even meet again. Like people, yeah. like, I, and I, I was guilty of this. Like as a child, like I was, I considered myself overweight. And if I saw someone or thought they were good looking, like I wouldn't even get up off the subway. I was so petrified of what this boy who's never going to speak to me Right. He's going to think of the shape of my booty. Right. And uh, I mean, the things we do to ourselves for people who we don't even know, who will never speak to us because, and we talked about right. it before, what we think of what they think of what we think, right? It's like a right. vicious circle. Love yeah. that. Love and that. And it doesn't matter. You know, I, I think that um, the most powerful thing that we can do for ourselves is let ourselves off the hook. Um, Brene Brown does this whole thing on shame. If if you've never seen mm -hmm. her, Brene Brown, look her up on YouTube. She's awesome. I just love her. But it's almost so obvious, yet we miss it. I found that I was carrying something, um, you know, from years behind, and I hadn't thought about it in decades. And I realized what it was one day, and I was like, you've been carrying this around like a fool, like a giant wheelbarrow full of dirt. And I just let it go. It's okay. It doesn't even, it doesn't matter. I think that after you lose someone, you go through something, you have a different perspective on what really is important to you and what isn't. And I think the shame of it is when we let that go and go back to our old ways and let it, mm. you know, other people decide what we should be doing. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody, right? You know, it's just- Yeah, absolutely. Mostly so Christine, are there things. any- <laughs> 
Are there any techniques or tools that you have found most, whether it be, and again, I, I, I don't want to necessarily, because as I said, you're so fun, I could talk to you for hours, but um, whether maybe you have both techniques, kind of like while you were going through the process of your treatment and just in life, now that it's it's kind of moved on that, that support you in really feeding your soul and, and that keeps you so vibrant and, and I say the word spunky because I love it, but like yeah, just so spunky. alive, um, alive. I mean, every morning when I get up, I sit on the floor and I do some yoga and I stretch and it's way better for my mind than it is for my body. I believe I give myself that time. I like to start my day off with some peace and some quiet and some meditation and I just like to do that for me because I could never do that before. It was one of the things that I yearned for after having surgery. Like, please, God, let me just sit on the floor. Like I just and then I could sit on the floor, but I couldn't get up. So I'm very happy to sit on the floor and get up. Um, nice. Another strategy for me, uh, I I really went against my body in that when I was in a weakened state, maybe I was on medication or post-surgical or whatever it was, chemotherapy, I would push myself so hard instead of giving myself the grace to be like, it's okay. This is temporary. And you have to take care of you before you can take care of everybody else. So I gave myself the grace and I didn't feel guilty for not doing, you know, oh, I'm not cooking. Oh, I'm not this. Oh, I'm not that. I, and I went away on business last week and it's still, it comes back. I cooked my husband and my stepson like two days worth of meals because I felt guilty. Like I wasn't going to be home. What an idiot. They could have fended for themselves, but they were doing some nice things to me. I thought it would be a nice thing to do, but that really is, is it. Um, you know, you got to give yourself some grace, give yourself that mental time. Nothing is, nothing is super urgent. Uh, other than, you know, maybe an ambulance if you had somebody that needed it. But um, and realizing that the strongest gift that you can have is self-confidence, knowing mm -hmm. that you're good. And that is a very rare commodity. And it's something we give ourselves. So that would be my those would be my tricks. Like, it's all OK. It's all OK. It's going to be fine. Most things are temporary. And that's how I got through. I love that. I love that. And and yeah, so true about giving yourself the grace and allowing, you know, it, there's something we think we have to constantly be on the on the run and right. sacrificing ourselves to please others. Like we have to prove that we right. can take up the space we have to take. Yeah, absolutely. My mother told me when I was a kid. So my mother was born in uh, 1940 from an Italian immigrant family. And she didn't speak Italian because, you know, they were trying to just assimilate. So they only spoke English. And she used to tell me when I was a little girl, you know, you're judged by how clean your house is. And I was like, that's ridiculous. Like you can judge somebody else. That's not going to work for me. And I just never, I never picked up a lot of those things, but there was still other things that I picked up. And that is that when you're a mom, you have to sacrifice. You have to give everything. You have to take care of this one and take care of that one. Um, no, you have to you have to be okay and not break because yeah, you're going to take care of them. But the way you're going to take care of the people you love the most is with love. If you don't love yourself, you can't give it to anybody else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Doesn't and, matter and I if think... my house is messy. No, that's that's I, well, I'm it totally does. on board and, with that. And I just decided I was going to get a cleaning lady. Uh, have her come once every two weeks and that would solve a you know a, a, a bunch of problems absolutely and you know it's it's really interesting because again women in particular have quite often like men will easily just like oh what no okay get a friend get johnny to do it do, 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 yeah. bring all your friends whereas women quite often have this like shame we don't want to acknowledging admit. We don't want to admit I'm that we would love it. some support. Right. I'm not good at cleaning. I got to be honest. I can build business. I can do lots of things. When I try to <laughs> when I try to clean my own house, I'm standing there with the mop and the broom and the Windex and the paper towels. And I have all these things and I go from room to room. And I swear to God, I must have so rebelled against what my mother said as a child that it rendered me incapable to do it like 
effectively. I just, I just walk around and I, and then I vacuum and then there's more dust and then I dust and then I have to do the wet. It's just, it's not my, it's not my gift. <laughs> you do the floor and then you do the counter. You're like, well, that didn't make sense. I well, probably should have done the counter first and gotten the crumbs down on the ground. I'm not good at it. When I, when I first met my husband, my Jose, he was, you know, we were both single for a long time, separately, of course. And he would clean his house and I wouldn't, I had the cleaning lady come, you know, every so often. And, and I said, well, you know, you can clean if you like, but if you want me to clean, I'm going to hire somebody. And he thought that was horrible until we actually were too busy. And I, I have somebody that I trust and brought in and they come when I'm not home and I come home and the house smells like fabuloso. And I think that that's awesome. And I'm just more useful doing other things. I'm not good at that. And we're all, I'm, I'm proud but to you say know, I can't clean. Christina, though, you know, what's interesting is say, you know, I'm not useful in, but even if you were, wouldn't that be two, three hours so much more beautiful to go on a date or a picnic yeah, or with friends walk. or, yeah, exactly. Like we there's certain things that. like. It's okay if we give ourselves that time. It's okay if we do that for ourselves. I used to feel guilty if I sat on the couch. Like, what's wrong with me? Was that like, yeah. did my mom give me that? I don't think so. I don't know. And I think there's a in, in, in different different conversation, but there's also this idea that certain things, especially when you are in a couple, somehow get assumed to be the woman's role. Um, and you're like, and I think learning to have those conversations and being able, because that's, I think, where we can get kind of tripped up sometimes is thinking we have the value in ourselves to have the conversation to question, hey, wait a second, I'm, this isn't my job, right? I love that. So I want to make sure, no, I want to make sure we leave time for, um, for questions and everything. And we kind of went through the key takeaways of listening, talked about who you were before. Um, and we didn't really touch on your non-for-profit organization. So I don't know if you want to touch on that really quick and just kind of like your, your intention, like, I obviously, and I didn't really talk about here, but your realtor mortgage broker, she's like a realtor queen. So this is like a heart project that you have. It is. Uh, what, what, so what's what's your kind of vision project, right now? Real quick, um, I realized while I was making the documentary that other women may not have had the resources. So I made this for the women to come behind me. And I decided to start a nonprofit of the same name, you'll be okay too.org. And this nonprofit is designed to take the scary out of this. So many women are so afraid, especially on Long Island, that they're going to get breast cancer, that they won't get a mammogram and they won't get tested because they think that if I don't get the test, I'm not going to get the disease. And they're afraid of the disease because of the treatment. So if we can show that I and other women went through this and we're okay, it's going to empower other women to get tested and stay healthy. And even if you get a positive, you're getting it so early that you don't have to have such radical treatment. And the second is to share stories of women thriving through and after breast cancer for the rest of us, especially while you're going through it. A lot of women are at home. We're faced with such negativity in our lives. So I want to make sure that we're empowering those women and we're coming up with a training that's going to really teach women diagnosed with breast cancer or in crisis, how they can mentally prepare and be in a better place. So that's what the nonprofit is designed to do. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Thank you. I such, such love and respect for, for you. Thank Guys, you. I want to open up 